Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello and good day, listeners. I have something great for you today, like every week. I would like to introduce Eve Lefkowitz. She is the executive director of the charity Conversations to Remember, which by reading her website, I understand was started by her son, and she's going to tell us all about it. So thanks for joining me, Eve. Jennifer, thank you so much for having me, and I'm very excited to be able to share Conversations to Remember with all of your viewers and listeners. Um, yes, it was started by my son. It actually was pretty much founded by my whole family. I have a son and a daughter. My daughter is a college student and my son is a high school student. And at the beginning of the pandemic, my mother-in-law, she had Alzheimer's and she was in an assisted living community in a memory care unit. And as everybody out there knows, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, doors were shut and nobody could come in or visit at the assisted living communities. So my mother-in-law was literally locked in and we were very lucky that she had a smartphone and we were able to start video chatting with her um, during that time. Now she had dementia, but when the pandemic started, she was at a stage where she was able to speak with us and and uh, not just understand us, but speak back to us on the cell phone. And we had conversations. Um, it got to the point where we were speaking with her for hours every day. It would alternate my husband, my son, my daughter, because obviously we were all home. My kids were, were home doing school at home. We were working from home and we spent hours a day speaking with her. Um, and at the same time, uh, I will say prior to the pandemic, my son had also been, in addition to my children, always visiting the community that my mother-in-law lived in and interacting with all the seniors there. My son also was volunteering at another assisted living community in our neighborhood. And he also was locked out of volunteering when the pandemic hit. So after we were speaking with my mother-in-law all the time, He contacted the community he had been volunteering in, and he asked them if they could set him up on a video call with some of the seniors that he used to speak with when he would go in there on a weekly basis. So that's what happened. They set him up with a video call with one senior, and he asked a friend of his if they wanted to do it with him, and they were very excited to do it. And... Then he started telling some of his other friends about it. And they all said, oh, that sounds good. I want to do that too. And he contacted the community and he got a second senior um, to join on the on the call, a different call. So we started a second call and he started doing two weekly calls with two seniors in that community. And that was kind of proof of concept for conversations to remember. And I will tell you that almost two years later, my son with those same friends is still doing weekly calls with those same two senior citizens. They both have dementia, uh, but they are both still in these community, in this community. And they both look at my son and, and the other students on this call as their family. Um, it's really a beautiful thing. So my son had turned to us and said, Hey, you know, this is great what I'm doing with these two people. But there are so many other seniors who are locked in in these places and they're lonely and they're, they have nobody's allowed to visit them. They can't go out. But can't, how can we make this bigger? And Conversations to Remember was born. So my son was 16 at the time. He's now a senior in high school. But um, uh, And my daughter, as I mentioned before, she was in college. So she jumped on board too. And my daughter's a communications major in college, and she was the perfectly situated to help us craft our training program, which she pretty much designed and helps to train other people on how to do the training. Um, and 
we then, my husband got involved. He's, he was also working from home <laughs> and my business had been kind of destroyed by COVID. So I had the time um, and we became an official 501c3 charity. Oof. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a family uh, affair and we live it. We eat, sleep and breathe conversations to remember. Um, at this point, we are coming, coming on, rounding on two years of, of us being in existence. And we have students, volunteers, and senior citizens from all across the country. We are located in New Jersey. My, my family, my daughter goes to school out of state, but my, my family is in New Jersey. And so our virtual headquarters is in New Jersey. But we have students and seniors as far away from us as Hawaii and Alaska. Um, and then on the continental United States, everywhere, north, south, east, and west. So it's really been a, a great thing. And while we started out geared only towards seniors who have dementia, one of the things that was brought to our attention sort of early on was that Feelings of isolation and loneliness were not limited to those who had dementia. And we were asked if we would expand it to include any senior citizen who is feeling lonely or, or would appreciate a video call with student volunteers. And so, of course, we said yes. And so we offer weekly video calls with high school and college students to senior citizens who would appreciate it. And while it's open to everyone, I will tell you that the majority of seniors who are in our program do have some amount of cognitive decline. Um, and we basically say, if they can appreciate the conversation, they are welcome to be a part of it. So even seniors who are not living in the same here and now as us, as you and I, um, are welcome to join the the calls so on, well i'm sorry now go ahead <laughs> uh, so what we do is we have two to three students on each call and the, each group of two to three students are assigned to a particular senior citizen and that is their call so each senior has his or her own kids and Every single week, there's a date and time that's picked out. And every single week at that day and that time, the students and the senior log on to the call and the students commit to one hour of their time. Now, <clears throat> the senior can have the full hour, but if the senior only wants to talk for 15 minutes, that's fine too. Um, it's basically up to the senior how long they want to talk and the students will like I said, stay for up, up to the full hour. We do have some times when senior might want to stay on longer. And if the students are available and they don't have something to go to afterwards, we have calls that do go on longer. But really the, the idea is that it'll be one hour. And we train our students. We don't just throw them onto a call. So... What we do is our student volunteers, first they come to a video uh, training where we teach them about the do's and the don'ts. Uh, how do we teach them how to speak with a senior citizen who has cognitive decline? We teach them a little bit about the different symptoms that they might encounter with a senior who has dementia. Um, we talk to them about the fact that the seniors are not on this in this program to be interviewed and they're not supposed to be, you know, cross examining them or, or asking them question after question so that the senior feel like, feels like they're writing a book about them. That it's really about relationship building. And we work with the students on how to make a conversation happen. Like we teach them that, first of all, for the senior who just wants to talk and tell their stories that of course you listen and you be compassionate and engaged with the senior. But for the senior who's more reserved and quiet and needs the students to bring them out, we teach the students to share of themselves, to start by, 
telling a story about something in their lives and then bring the senior into that. So maybe the student will talk about um, an exam that they had uh, yesterday and then they and talk about how, you know, this is their favorite subject, the least favorite subject. And that then transitions into the, hey, what's everybody else's favorite or least favorite subject? And bring the senior into that. Um, we understand that if I were to ask you, and, and this is even not just somebody with cognitive decline, but if I were to ask you a question out of the blue and it's something you haven't been thinking about, sometimes it's like you're a deer in the headlights. You can't access the answer. You just don't know what, what's your favorite food. I don't know. But if somebody starts talking about their favorite food or their least favorite food, well, you're thinking about that. So if I'm sitting here t- telling you a story about like the weirdest food combination that I have ever eaten, you're not just thinking about the weird, what I'm telling you, you're thinking about other weird foods that you might have eaten or things that you might put together. So when it's your turn to speak, it's a much easier, a w- it's much easier for you to access that information. So that's something that we work on with the students and make sure that, um, we teach them to keep the conversations light and fun and engaging. Um, and it's not a debate. It's not about, you know, we never want to upset the senior. And also we teach them about joining the senior in whatever their reality is. So for the senior who is not living in the same here and now that the rest of us are, the students jump in to whatever reality the senior is in. Um, and I'll talk more about that and give you some examples of that in a set in a minute or two. Um, but we, after the video training that we do, which is an hour long training, um, and it's followed up with a lot of written documents that help the students, we do something called a mock virtual visit. And we have someone who role plays with as the senior citizen on this mock virtual visit. We also have some of our senior student volunteers on there to be like the guides to the new student volunteers. And what we do is, and this was, I, I mentioned my, my daughter had crafted the training program. This was all her. And basically we, um, we, we pull students who we've been impressed with and who we think can be good trainers and we train them to be trainers. So those students will get on the mock call with the new student volunteers and give them a little bit of an orientation. And as the call is going on, if need be, they'll stop them and guide them and redirect them and give them feedback and help them so that they can be successful. And We don't accept every student into the program. While I hate to turn down any student ever, our mission is for the seniors. So we need to make sure that the students who join our program are ones that can make the conversations happen. And for the student who's too introverted and can't get past that for the program, this just isn't the right fit for them. So because for the senior to get on, we never want the senior to feel the pressure of what should we talk about today? Yeah. So it, and it's, it shouldn't be. Now, obviously, if the senior has something they want to talk about, they go for it. But for the seniors who don't, that's what the students need to be bringing to the table. That makes sense. I hope your daughter got some course credit for setting up the training program. No, she, no, you know what? Wrong. We all get we all get feel good credits. Neither <laughs> my son, my daughter, nobody gets credits. We all get feel good credit. <laughs> I think that's a a definite example of the lack of understanding of what caregiving and everything that's involved. You know what that I mean. It's, there's a lot more involved than I think people that aren't haven't experienced it are aware of but i love how like you've got teenagers training teenagers so even if they don't go into 
a senior care career or medical career or something related to what they're doing now, they're learning how to be trainers. And that's a an very important skill. So this is this yes. has got benefits all sprout in every direction. That's just that that warms my heart this early Monday morning. <laughs> well, what really warms my heart is how so many of these students want to do this. And yes, some of them, look, truth be told, some of them are doing it because they need a certain amount of community service hours. But even for those that are starting because they need community service hours, they're staying when their hours are complete, which is really impressive. Um, and I know this because they'll have me sign off on their community service hours and then they'll say, well, I've met my, my requirement. Can I stay? And we're like, of course, this is not for, we, we don't do this exclusively for your community service. Yeah. We want you to stay forever. Um, I'll and, give you this phrase my dad always said. What is this? Dumb question quiz time. <laughs> <laughs> you exactly. can use that one with them. There you go. But even choosing uh, conversations to remember is... That's that's saying something about these students because yes. I'm trying to remember my daughter's 30. So I'm trying to remember back to the community service requirements. I don't even remember what she did. Eh, so much for those memories. <laughs> she got lucky. My her husband or her husband, my husband and I are Rotarians and she did something through our Rotary Club, which is, you know, making pancakes for a community event or, you know, it's very it's a it's a less less involvement. Oh, great great grammar there, Jen. There's less emotional involvement in a lot of a lot of the options that are out there. So just by choosing conversations to remember is telling. You know, that's they want to talk to older people for whatever reason, not just so they can graduate from high school, which is <laughs> fair. And then so how how else do you find these students? You know, it's funny, a lot of it is grassroots because we have students in our program and then they tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on. But we also do outreach um, and we have colleges and high schools advertising for us. Um, we bring on volunteers who will outreach for us too. Um, so there's lots of ways to volunteer with us, not just on the video calls. So and, and we have adults who volunteer with us to help with outreach. We have them, we have call support people now. Uh, that's something uh, that's come up. Basically, to be a senior in our program, you need to have a caregiver who will help you get onto the video call. That's, it's, it's unfortunately, we can't work with people who are home alone because most of them just aren't able to handle the technology. Um, and not that our call technology is that difficult, but just technology in general for somebody, especially somebody who has cognitive decline is kind of beyond their grasp. So what we, we rely on the, the care person and whether it's the care staff in a senior living community or a care, a, a private caregiver. So it could be a family member of somebody who's at home or if they have a private caregiver, we rely on them to start the call. We rely on the students to get on on time. But what we've also started in recent uh, months is bringing on volunteers who will help get the calls started. So they will, um, we don't have every shift covered because we actually, we do call, we offer calls seven days a week over a 12 hour period. Um, and so we don't have every shift covered, but we're getting them covered little by little with volunteers who reach out and want to want to help us. Um, and so the volunteer will contact the caregiver a few minutes before the call is supposed to start, make sure they're good to go. Uh, if they're having any technical issues, simple technical issues, have the, uh, the support person walk them through it and then, uh, get on and make sure the students are all on, make sure everybody can see and hear each other. And then during the call, even, and then they get off when the call starts, when everybody's on and ready to go, they'll get off. <clears throat> but even while the call is going on, oftentimes somebody, well, the senior might touch something, like right? they might mute themselves or disconnect themselves or their Wi-Fi may be struggling. And so the students will reach out to us and 
uh, somebody from Conversations to Remember will then contact the caregiver and help get everything back on track. So we are supporting these calls throughout from before they start until they end. Um, but we, but it's, it's a call between the students and, and the senior. So we just have lots of, uh, available opportunities for people to help on the back end. That makes sense. And is there a specific reason for video chats versus just a regular phone call for like my paternal grandmother? Cause she passed away at 103 probably wouldn't have been it. Well, she was mostly blind from glaucoma. So that would have made just dialing into the zoom call a little more challenging. Her mental faculties were great until the last year of her life. So I think she would have appreciated a, just a normal phone call. So is there a reason for video specifically? Yes, there, is. there is, you know, it's fine to talk on the phone, but you don't have that same feeling of socialization as you do when you're seeing each other. And we don't do one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, our policy is that a student is not allowed to be alone on the call with the senior. Um, and that's for everybody's safety and protection, but it's also because conversation flows better with a group because it's not reliant on you speaking or me speaking. There's three or four of us on here. And then when one of us doesn't have something to say, somebody else is going to chime in and it allows for a better flow of conversation and, um, and a group phone call. That's much harder for somebody to follow who's speaking. Whereas on a video call, you can see my mouth moving. You know, I'm the one speaking. You also, we have, we make sure that they write their names in the box on the bottom so that the senior doesn't have to remember the name. They can see it. Um, and that's helpful too. So they can, people know who's speaking. And for the seniors, it feels more like a social as it feels more like socialization. So I'm not putting down phone calls. Phone calls are very important, but they serve a different purpose. You don't feel like it's a visit when it's on the phone. So, so yes, that, that's why we do the video calls and. We also, for people who don't have access to uh, a device to do them on, we'll, we'll, sit, we'll buy and send them a tablet. Um, it's, we call it a long-term loan, but basically as long as you're in the program, you can use the tablet. For We have seniors in the program who have trouble hearing, so we've started sending headphones. Um, we tried doing uh, speakers, but to be honest, on the video calls, the speakers weren't uh, doing such a, a good job for them. But the headphones, all of a sudden, somebody who couldn't hear as well, now they can hear every word that's being said. So that's been a, a terrific thing. So we do whatever we can to really support the seniors and have them get the most that they can out of these calls. That makes sense. I know early on in the pandemic, we had a Zoom call with our best friends and we have like an 80, I don't know, ridiculous size television <laughs> that I let my husband buy when we moved right before the pandemic started. So it was a good choice. <laughs> and the dog was watching the screen for it. And I've got the cutest photo. I'll try to remember to share it when this episode comes out. But you're right. Being able to see, you know, the two of us were talking to the two of them and the dog was kind of like, huh. And because the TV is so large, they looked kind of life size. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it felt like they were in the room with us. And it was, it was interesting. We didn't do a ton of Zoom socializations, but I can see how that's definitely more social, like you were saying. So how, how do the seniors or the caregivers find you, especially those that are in a care residence? Well, we do, we do as much outreach as we can. We have volunteers who do outreach. Um, they can find us through Google. Um, we, and just from others in their industry. Um, we have a, a social media presence. We have, we have an Instagram. We have Facebook. We have LinkedIn. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's, it's hopefully people, they will find us or, they will take our call when, when we reach out. 
uh, for the person who's home with a private caregiver, we they need to find us because we can't call each person who's home alone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for the communities, hopefully we've touched some somebody in their community or a community that's owned by the same organization and uh, and hopefully that's how they find out about us. Once we're in a community, then we typically spread like wildfire. Um, well, we have some communities where every single day we're doing calls multiple times a day with different residents in their community. Um, if it's a, for some of the larger ones, uh, we have smaller communities that might only have a dozen people uh, living in the community and we might have fewer people in there because not every senior wants to do this and not every senior can do it. So if your dementia has progressed to the point where you really can't interact at all on the call, then it's not for you. And unfortunately, since we have been doing this, we're, we're closing in on two years now. Um, We've lost many seniors over time to their either their physical or their mental health declining to a point where they can't continue on the calls. So it's just a factor of reality. That is very true. I was very relieved not to have to try to figure out how to stay in touch with my mom during the pandemic because her Alzheimer's was very advanced. And for anybody that hasn't heard previous episodes, my mom died March 31st, 2020. So right at the start of all of this last couple of years of crazy, she, her visual processing was total garbage. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure on a phone, I'm not sure she'd be able to interact at all just because it's not big enough. Um, a computer screen, maybe, but... I don't, I don't, I, that, like I said, I, I don't think she would have been able to participate well. And I just, I'm really glad I didn't have to find out and I didn't have to do those window visits. Yeah. And I truly, truly wish that the, you know, the care communities would find better, a better option to like, I do not think families should be shut out, but I, they do need, you know, the, the residents do need protecting. So how do we, how do we find that balance? And at least with your phone calls, that's, that helps a lot of people, but you know, it's like, okay, people, it's been a couple of years, you know, we, but there should be some meetings and boards and whatever, all that corporate stuff that I've never done. <laughs> I'm not a corporate player. I don't play well with others. Yeah, they need no, to I'm start figuring on all that. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm on the same page. We're on separate sides of the country, you and I, but I, both of our states were really hit very hard early on. And so uh, I'm with you. My, my mother-in-law, she passed at the end of June uh, in 2020. And it was from her dementia. But being locked in, um, I believe, and obviously I could never know this for sure, but I believe that her dementia progressed much faster than it would have. If she hadn't been locked in the way she had, there was just, you know, it, it, it was just a very quick decline and, and she passed away the end of June 2020. But while it's heartbreaking, I think for her to have lived for the next two years locked in the way she had been is just something that I can't even fathom how it could have happened and it's happened for so many people and i speak with family members uh you know who've suffered through this and my heart breaks and i speak with the seniors sometimes who've suffered through this and my heart just breaks so this is our little way of trying to make it better but to be honest even after after you know really COVID is in the rearview mirror and not, it seems like it may be starting to get there, um, <laughs> but I'm always afraid to say that because you never know. But um, even when COVID really is someday so much a part of our past, conversations to remember will continue moving forward because one of the things that I have learned from this whole experience is that 
feelings of isolation and loneliness didn't start because of the COVID-19 lockdowns. They just became more apparent to everybody during that. And yeah, I'm sure they were exacerbated a bit, but they existed before and they're not going away after. Um, you know, as people get on in age, things change for them, whether it's physical or mental. And it's not uncommon to feel lonely, feel socially isolated, even when you might be in a group of a hundred people. So for somebody who lives in a long-term care community and that's their world, maybe they see the same 50 people every single day and they still feel lonely and socially isolated because they're only seeing those 50 people. Whereas before they were of a, at a point in their lives where they had to live in a community with somebody assisting them, they could go out anytime they wanted. They could go to the mall, they could go out to dinner, they could, you know, get in their car and drive and see their friends, they could do whatever they wanted, just by the nature of whether it's, like I said, physical or cognitive decline, seniors just have more feelings of isolation and loneliness. So conversations to remember will still continue to fill that gap. And so that's something that we look forward to it being you know, not because of COVID, but yeah. more just an everyday experience for these seniors. Well, I can see it being very beneficial to a family caregiver. Many of them have the have similar struggles. They're, you know, they're stuck at home with their loved one. You know, it's sometimes it's almost more trouble than it's worth to you know, get somebody to come in and sit with your loved one while you go out and do whatever it is you need or want to do. And it seems like every time you manage to do that, something happens and then you're, you know, you have to abort those plans and just having somebody else talk to your loved one. So you can take a bubble bath or, you know, take a nap or whatever, just be present, but not, you know, like it's a mental break. It, yeah. I meant that's perfect. Yes. You know, and sometimes, because I've seen, and I'm sure you have too on social media, it's like, you know, oh, my grams was just being just really obnoxious, but with my niece, you know, she's been great. And it's like, I think grams just need to see somebody else's face. I think that, you know, mom was tired of dealing with just me. She needed other people. And I'm even in advanced Alzheimer's. I think that that's helpful when they, you know, it's like after a while, you know, it's like you have a family. It's There's times when it's like, please leave because I'm tired of you people. <laughs> like my husband was gone over the weekend and I was talking to a new neighbor and she goes, sometimes it's just nice, huh? I'm like, yeah, it's like you could just do your own thing. Even though 99% of my day, I do my own thing and he does his own thing. It's just the only souls I had to worry about over the weekend were the two dogs and myself. And the dogs make their needs very clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm com I'm completely with you. Um, I know in in our program, uh, for the seniors who remember, um, relationships build, and they remember the students week to week. We have a number of seniors who, at the end of the calls, will say, "I love you" to the students, which is just heartwarming, um, because they just really enjoy the students. We've had seniors tell us that you know, oh, my kids, like they call them their kids. They they think of them as their family, as like their grandchildren or their nieces and nephews. And that's a wonderful thing. But even for the senior who doesn't remember the calls, they end the call with a positive feeling and they remember the feeling because we have seniors uh, here. We have one, we have one woman. I'll give you an example. We have one woman who has been in our program for over a year. And she has short-term memory loss where every five minutes she pretty much resets. She doesn't remember more than five minutes of information. And she does the weekly calls with us every week and loves them. And she, one time she had asked, I guess, as her call was ending, to have a second weekly call. We said, sure, of course. So she does two weekly calls. She doesn't remember them week to week. She doesn't remember them in between each call. There's somebody else in her community who also does a weekly call. And one day they were sick. So she got on to that 
the, that other call with the students. And she loved it. We have our students uh, give us feedback forms after every call. This way we know what's going on on the calls. Um, and the response, the feedback that we got from the three students on that call that she substituted in on was, wow, she really loved this call, but she didn't really seem to know what it was about. You should like have her do her own weekly call. I started laughing because <laughs> she does her own weekly call twice a week for a year. And she just, when she got on with them, it was like the first time for her. So, but she loved it. Um, so what we give somebody, even if they can't remember the call, is we give them a feeling that they do carry with them. And that's something you can't buy. That's true. So speaking of buying, our services are all free. We are a charity. Um, we accept donations. <laughs> we, we, we love donations. We, uh, we, we accept corporate sponsorships, private donations, um, and volunteers. Uh, and everything that we give, we give for free. We will never charge for anything that, that any of these services. How did the students feel when the, the seniors become attached and, you know, they say, I love you and all that stuff. I'm, I'm assuming they feel good about it. Oh, they feel very good. Um, the st we also, I mean, at the same time, we have students who get very attached to the seniors. I mean, some really wonderful relationships develop. And one of the hardest things that happens is when a senior progresses to the point, whether it's physical or mental, where they can't continue with the call anymore. And the students just, they're very upset um, because there's nothing we can do. We, we never, we won't allow the seniors and the students to communicate independently. We, we want to protect everyone. We're dealing with, um, you know, populations of people who, need protecting both the seniors and the students. So they don't have a way to contact each other independent of us. They always log on to the, a platform that we use that's embedded in our website. Nobody has each other's phone numbers. People don't have last names except for the senior who likes to be called Mrs. So-and-so. That's the only time the students will know the last name. Um, and so it is tough for the students when they can't see the senior anymore because the senior can't do it. And it's also hard for the students when sometimes their schedules change and they can't continue doing the volunteering. And, you know, we always ask them to, to say goodbye to the seniors. And in fact, sometimes they can come back as a guest. Um, next we we have spring breaks are coming for a lot of the students and so we're busy putting substitutes onto calls and we have one call where uh in the next couple of weeks i have we have two students who used to be on a call with this senior who are going to come back uh just for these two days because they're on spring break so they can make it but the students who are normally on it are on spring break and can't make it so the senior's going to get to see some people from class from the past type of thing, which will be nice. Well, we had in my old community a, um, an adult day program that incorporated kids. It was at a school, so the in the morning the preschoolers would come over and do things with the seniors, and in the afternoon the um, elementary, like the older elementary school children came over and some of the seniors could assist with a little bit of homework or they would do, they would read to each other. Obviously in the morning, the seniors could read to the little kids and sometimes in the afternoons it flipped, the switch flipped. And when I talked to that director of that program, it was really obvious that this was sort of like substitute grandparents, substitute grandchildren, and the kids benefited, the seniors benefited, but what was really obvious was how the person who wasn't present, the caregiver, the parent, the, you know, the, the adult child of the person that was in the program, whoever was in the middle, they benefited as well. And it, even though they weren't present and it, I'm assuming the same thing happens through you guys, just 
spread across the country because you're not you're not servicing just one small city. Yes, and I mean one of one of the the tough things about our program is we we do get to know the caregivers who uh, or the family members where the person is at home with the caregiver. We don't always get to know the family members of the senior who's in a community. We infrequently do, and and that's unfortunate. We're trying to work on a way that we can get to know them more because um, I think that's a an important thing. We you know we want to make sure things are go- are going well, um, and we do speak with the caregivers who work at the communities, and we get the feedback from them. Um, but we have had occasion where the family members will even be present during a call. And the feedback we get from that is tremendous. I will tell you a story. This happened about a year ago. We had a senior who started calls with us um, and had been doing them. Maybe it happened less than a year ago because I think she had been on the calls for at least 10 months. And she, when she started, she actually did not have cognitive decline. But as time went on, she developed a form of dementia and she developed both physical and cognitive issues. The, it was very clear that, that she was, um, declining substantially. And the very last call she was on, her daughter was with her and, um, it was during the pandemic, but what we didn't know was it was, it was an end of life visit. And the students logged on and the woman was asleep, so to speak. At least the students thought she was asleep. And the daughter asked the students, would they mind just talking to her? Because she, you know, she's sure that the woman could hear them and that she knows how meaningful those conversations that she had had with them over all those months had been. And the students talked for the hour and we found out the next day that shortly after that conversation, the woman had passed. And it was one of those things where those conversations had been so impactful for that senior that the daughter wanted the senior to get the benefit of it, even at the end. And, and that was just, that was very moving for me. It's moving to me. Like that. <laughs> so it's possible that woman needed to hear from those students to feel the closure that I understand that they need at the end. Because I got to see my mom the day before she passed away, and they, the staff basically said, "Oh, mom's not doing so great. My mom had fallen and broken her leg, oh. and." So I, she was in the hospital with, right at the beginning of the pandemic. That was exciting. Mm. And I saw her March 8th, 12th, 14th, and 16th. And each day it got more and more. There was more and more procedures to for entry into the community. And then on the um, March 16th, 2020 is when our governor said, yep, everything in the San Francisco Bay Area is shut down. Stay home. Don't do anything. And I was like, okay, this is not cool. But they called and said that she, quote, wasn't doing so well. And I went and saw her and she was kind of, you know, asleep. And it was really obvious to me. I'm like, eh, I don't think we're going to be going to watch children in this near future, which is what mm-hmm. we did. We'd go we'd go to the park or the pool or wherever. And she just loved to watch kids doing what kids do. And I, I managed to tell her because she thought I was her best friend. But I talked to her and I said, you know, she did a great job and. You know, everybody would be fine. And, you know, I just, I kind of named everybody. And, and then I finally said, go find dad, go find your mom, you Aww. know, it, you know, well, I'll be fine. It's okay. You did a great job. And I did a podcast recording the next morning. I got off the call. I was contemplating lunch when they called and they said, come now. And there and, ended up 10 of us outside of her room. And the poor executive director was having a complete mental break. He was like, (laughs) it was, he was so kind and he he never once, you know, tried to indicate that we needed to get out. I mean, he did with his face, but he never said anything, but it was really obvious that it was like, please go in the parking lot. But yeah, I kind of felt like she needed to hear those things 
And I'm, I'm assuming that that woman that those students talked to needed to hear those, whatever they said, she just needed to connect with them one last time to, to feel whatever it is we need to feel at the end to, to let go. So that's, I'm, I'm with you on that. We had a similar experience with my mother-in-law because obviously we couldn't go into her assisted living uh, community. And the day she passed, we got a call from them saying, come now. Like right now, drop everything and come now. And my husband and and my son and my daughter and I all went and we spent the day holding her hand and talking to her. And she was unconscious the whole time, but you could tell by the breathing that she could heal us. Or at least we thought that. Look, I can't really know, but you feel that way. And so I don't know if it was uh, just a good closure for us, or if it was a closure for her, because she did not pass until we were there. So, uh, you know, we all tell ourselves things to make ourselves feel better. I don't know. I like to think that she waited to be surrounded by us. The, my, it's my understanding they can hear. I've I've talked to enough hospice people that the the feeling that way is is the is the norm i guess but yeah they they think that people they can hear you sometimes they they react in their own way through the breathing and stuff so you know it's yeah it's imp- i think yeah. it's important and it's i think it's lovely that you had students that could be there at the end for this this senior cuz that's that's special and how yeah. did, did the students, I guess she passed off have, after they. She passed after. And I have to be honest, um, we can't tell students when someone passes. Mm. Um, most of the, we don't even always know. Mm. Um, we can't tell them. First of all, we don't always know because there are HIPAA laws. And so people can't tell us. Uh, so sometimes we're just left wondering. <laughs> but our students are all remote from us. And we can't know what sort of emotional support they might need if we were to, to give them the news that somebody passed. And so we can't do that because we don't want to ever put a student in emotional distress and we wouldn't know about it. So our standard is that the person just can't continue on the calls anymore, which 90% of the time is accurate. They more than 90% of the time, they end up leaving our calls because they're just not physically or cognitively able to continue. And sometimes it's also because at the end they leave the community. And so they're in the hospital or someplace else. And so we can't continue the calls. So we don't always know, but it's not information on the couple of times that we did know. It's not information we can share with the students Um, because I just I don't see a a safe way to do that for them, a healthy way to do that for them. That makes sense. It's interesting, though. Uh, That's that's probably like phase three of figuring out how to do things, because I'm sure they assume and they're old enough to to handle it emotionally, but well, they would definitely what? need a little support. Just age is not always an indicator of how someone will handle death. I mean, for my children, and, and they were 16, 17, something. I think my, my youngest was 16, 17, I guess, when my mother-in-law passed. And my daughter was about 19. And this was their first encounter with death. And it was devastating for them. And I wouldn't have wanted either of them to find out about it from someone else and be away at school or something and not have the support. So we, you know, we deal with students who are age as young as 14. Um, But we also deal with college students who are away from home. And so we, we don't want whoever put the students into a position where they are struggling emotionally and and we there's nobody 
identifying that because we don't see them other than, you know, they get on their calls. It's not like we have meeting. They're not my class. You know, they're not my students. So I don't see them every week or every day or anything like that. So we do want to protect them. We're here for the seniors, but I also want to, we also want to protect the students. That makes sense. So where can people find you on social media? Is it under, it's under yes. uh, C2R, right? Well, it's, it's conversations to remember. So our website, you can, we have a shortcut for our website. So you don't have to type so much, <laughs> which is C2R, the letter C, the number two, the letter R dot chat, C-H-A-T. And that's a shortcut that will take you to conversations to remember dot org, but that's a mouthful to type. Um, on social media, uh, just, just, uh, we're conversations to remember. So on, uh, Instagram is specifically geared towards us students. In fact, we, uh, multiple times a week, we post conversation topic suggestions so that students can see ideas of things to talk about that week. Um, and our Instagram is conversations dot to dot remember. And then on LinkedIn and on Facebook, it's, we're geared obviously towards the adult population. Um, and we are conversations to remember. So, uh, you can absolutely find us there. Easy enough to remember, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. And, and well, they are conversations to remember, even with cognitive decline, you know, that's what it's all about. It's about lighthearted, fun conversations that will make you feel good. When you were talking about conversations about strange food combinations, and I can't remember if this is on my website, I think it is. It's a barbecue chicken pizza taco. Which... Barbecue chicken pizza taco. So you got like okay. three different flavors going on. <laughs> and when you, even when you read the recipe, it's like, ew. <laughs> but I've learned, because I'm old enough now, I've learned that sometimes some strange combos are really good. And this one is really good. <laughs> so when you were talking about strange food combinations, Bingo. I was like, oh, yeah, the chicken, barbecue chicken pizza tacos. <laughs> Well, things like that, they always make for good conversation because different people have different experiences with different crazy combinations. And one of the things, you know, you could talk about anything, or almost anything on these calls, as long as it's, you know, lighthearted. Uh, we, we, we suggest to the students not to talk about politics and social issues because we, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but we don't want the conversations to be a debate. Or disagreement. Yeah. We don't want the senior to be upset. We do have some seniors in our program who will want to talk about those things. And some of those calls work fine with that. But if ever there's an issue, we steer it away. Um, but we have, we have lots of conversations re- revolving around food. I think that's a very popular topic. <laughs> food, the vac- travel, where people have been, um, the, TV shows, movies, uh, those are all things that are universal. Um, and, and when it comes to food, because we have students and seniors from all over the country, there's lots of local foods that I might not have heard of, or you might not have heard of that is in somebody's everyday diet, um, depending where they live. So that it makes for really interesting conversations. Well, I also think too, it'll help people understand, like if, you know, you got a California, progressive California teenager, maybe talking to an old Southern gentleman, you've got some different cultures going on there and understanding now, maybe the the senior might not benefit as much, but the, the student might, they might get a, an insight into other parts of our country, which I think we really need right now. So you, you are providing all kinds of services. <laughs> you know, there's definitely a lot of that going on. I hear about it all the time on, on our feedback forms about things that the students have learned and, and it's, it's really, it's really fun for them. So, and even the students don't usually don't know each other when they get on the call. So the students learn about things from the other students too. And some friendships have been developed between the students. Um, we once had a group of students ask, 
is it okay if we stay on after the call ends and hang out together? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Um, And they didn't know each other. They were from three different parts of the country. So it's, uh, there's lots of benefits to our program that came out that were not the expected benefits. That's the best kind. Yes. Well, I appreciate this conversation today. I'm going to definitely be paying more attention to your conversation starters and on Instagram, because that's my preferred social media platform. And if anybody is interested in participating in any version of their program, you know where to get to find them. Their website is hot linked in the episode notes. So you can, you don't even have to remember all the stuff she said a couple minutes ago. And, and keep hopefully, in, one more thing I'll just, uh-huh. I'll just mention, keep an eye on our social media and our website. Um, we, we celebrate Conversations to Remember Day at the end of June. And this year, what we're going to do for Conversations to Remember Day is we're going to do a bunch of different webinars in the month leading up to Conversations to Remember Day. Uh, and it's, you know, stay tuned for what they'll be about. It'll all be free. But uh, your listeners are more than welcome to join if they find a topic that uh, they find interesting to them. And we just want to, you know, educate people, inform people, help people in whatever way we can. Awesome. Well, definitely do that, guys, because you, if anybody knows me, I'm a curious person and I like to... I like to learn new things, which is one of the reasons I keep doing this podcast, because I keep learning new stuff about caregiving, and my mom's been gone almost two years. This is March 7th, 2022, and so it'll be two years at the end of this month. So again, I appreciate this, and um, if you make sure to tag me on the social media about the stuff in June, I will make sure to share it. That way I don't have to try to remember. We will definitely do that. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's our pleasure to to uh to be able to present it was my pleasure to be able to talk about conversations to remember and when i say our i'm referring to conversations to remember it's a pleasure to be featured on on your podcast well thank you fading memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts